Game two tonight. Obviously on Sportsnet. Leafs talk after the show. But right now, Stanley Cup and Jack Adams award winning coach. It's Claude Julien. Good morning. Thanks for making time, man. Hey, good morning, JD. Hey, so let's just start with this, plain and simple. What do you think about game one? Well, you, you know, uh, the one thing I would say about the Leafs is that, you know, they, they obviously have to play with controlled emotion. That's number one. Mm. And they gotta and they gotta stay within their their style of play, their system. I thought they uh you know, they tried earlier on to be really, really physical and all that stuff. And I don't think, you know, when you're a successful team during the regular season and especially how successful they've been for many years, that they have to change their style, but they have to probably bring a little bit more excitement and more commitment as a group and as individuals in order to succeed. Yeah. So how much of that though, do you think with them, because we've seen this time and time again with them come playoff time is there's players that are, I don't want to say around the fringes because that feels a little too uh, rude to guys like Nazem Kadri, but it does feel like some of the secondary players end up taking bad penalties early on in series for them or later in them. And how much of that do you think actually has to do with the fact that they're overcompensating for what the stars of the core four guys don't necessarily bring on the outset when it doesn't, when it comes to the stuff outside of scoring goals? Well, JD, I don't know what's being said inside that dressing room and and what the game plan is and everything else, but uh, you know, at the end of the day, you're right. You know, you don't want to be compensating for others. I think, you know, my, my assessment on that, and especially when I look at Toronto and say, well, what, what needs to be done here is that, Throughout an 82 game schedule, you know you're going to have your ups and downs. Everybody will because, and that's that's natural. I mean, uh, who can play perfect 82 games? Uh, uh, they're all human. They're they're athletes. They're not robots. So you understand that part of it. But I think what ends up having to happen in the playoffs is you got to create that excitement so that everybody, and not just one player or star players or or the you know the, the bottom six. Uh, have to bring something different. It's more about creating that excitement so that everybody brings the best out of themselves and and as a group and as individuals. And, you know, when you're playing playoff teams and there's a lot of teams that are on the outside right now that would love that opportunity, you got to somehow understand that you you have to be ready every game. And and not only that, but as you mentioned, with compensation, it's more about controlled emotion. Mm -hmm. Bring what you bring, but bring it to the best level you can. And that's what Stanley Cup uh, winning teams do. Uh, Let me ask you, someone who's been in that dressing room, does Brad Marchand leave those wrists exposed because he's tempting players to slash him there? Like, he wants it, right? Because that's all I can think of when I see that much skin. Well, absolutely. Yeah. You know, that's that's the way he plays, right? So he'll, if he knows he can get under somebody's skin, he will. Yeah. And uh, you know, with, with experience, JD, he's he's learned to do it in a way where he's not getting penalized. You know, early on in his career, he was getting caught and he was getting the penalties as well. But he's gotten better at it, so obviously he's going to do that. Yeah. How much, like specifically with him, because uh, like. The guys that you coached on this Bruins team, I think now it's, oh man, it's crazy how time flies. I think it's just Pasternak yeah. and, and Marchand, right? And Marchand. Yeah, yeah. that's what I mean. Exactly. But, but he seems to have a real comfort level with playing this team, if I put it mildly. Well, I think he's been very open about that when he said, like, I love playing against the Leafs. It's <laughs> yeah. one of his favorite teams to play against, right? And, yeah. and you know, ironically enough, he hasn't hidden that. Yeah. Uh, from anybody, and he just loves it for whatever reason. He loves beating the Leafs, and uh, he gets motivated, and and that's what I mean by you know he's got that extra motivation, which you you hope some of the Leafs players in that can somehow find some extra motivation, you know, by saying, listen, let's go play our best, let's have some fun out there by playing our best hockey that we know, and let's turn this tide around. You know, Boston's been beating us for years. you got to find some sort of excitement. And when I look at the goal that was scored by the Leafs last game is the exact way you're going to have to beat the Bruins. I thought, you know, like putting the puck at the net, uh, guys going towards the net, jumping on the loose puck, getting on the inside. And I said that, you know, a, a week ago that if the Leafs, didn't get on the inside of the Bruins. They didn't have a chance to win. So they, mm. it's okay to get some shots on them, but you got to get some quality shots and you got to get them from getting on the inside. And to me, that's not about having to be tough or anything. It's about just commitment, wanting to get there and, and not being deprived from getting 
in those areas and, and make an account. Yeah, the, the issue I have with it, I agree with you. Like everything you said is like obviously spot on and you're saying it from a place of um, the most experience. I, I guess it's just Toronto now has eight straight playoff games where they failed to score um, two or more goals. So this isn't like a recent issue. This isn't like a normal one game where this ends up happening. And, and I do wonder how much you think stuff like this actually is impacted by like a team's culture, right? Because you look at Boston and they play similar to the way that they played under you. And I'm curious how you think that stuff bleeds over. Again, you had some of those same leaders. Pasternak wasn't there at that point of his career, but Marchand was a, a leader from even a young age. But how that stuff tends to bleed over, and if you see that actually having an impact right now as we're looking at these two teams. Well, you know, it, it does, J.D., and, and I know that uh, when uh, Bruce Cassidy took over, he even said, like, I'm not changing anything from what Claude was doing here, and uh, he basically kept things the same way, and, and he brought that same, I guess, approach to Vegas. But then even Jim Montgomery uh, called me when he first got the job and asked me some questions about the you know, the team and how they played. And he said he didn't want to uh, change anything, just tweaks here and there. And so you're right, the culture is there and then they've had success that way. But it doesn't mean that, you know, what's happening with the Leafs is, is all wrong. I mean, they have success during the regular season. And I mean, they've got some great players. I just think it's more about the mindset of in the playoffs. Is there, you know, so much pressure on those guys because they, they haven't won you know, against Boston, they haven't won many rounds in the playoffs for years. That you know, how do you get rid of that mindset, and how do you create that positive mindset that's going to bring you into a, a series with some excitement and the the, the the want to change the narratives, I guess, and then make it successful. And this is where you know, again, I think it, it starts in the dress room and how they go out there in the ice and the approach that they take. So you, th- it sounds like you think that the mental edge that Boston has in this series is not overstated. No, not at all. I mean, well, why, why wouldn't it? Because at the end of the day, I mean, Boston knows how many series they've won against them. And, you know, the, the, the times that they've come back in game sevens and all that stuff, it, it's there. And it's probably being talked about as well, you know, amongst themselves and say, you know, so they motivate themselves that way. And on the other side, it's it's the other way around, right? You say, well, we haven't had much luck against that team. And uh, so it's it's in there. But uh, it's about trying to find a way to overcome those thoughts and just focus on the moment, focus on the present, not on the past, and, and change those narratives. Yeah. So, uh, again, you've coached against these guys, and they were younger players. Um, but you've also coached against them with Montreal as well. And I'm curious, yeah. if you were in Jim Montgomery's shoes right now, would you be hoping – that Sheldon Keefe goes back to reuniting Mitch Marner and Austin Matthews? Well, as a coach, in a way, I wouldn't care. Mm. Because, you know, at the end of the day, in the playoffs, I think it's really about focusing on your team and what you need to do. And that's where, you know, you you make adjustments along the way. If that's the case, then Jim has an opportunity to make the adjustment that he wants to make, whether it's, you know, having a different line matching uh, that line or whatever. But at the end of the day, and that's where if you worry too much about the opposition, you're not thinking about what you need to do. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, lead, the I guess the Bruins did what they needed to do to be successful in the first game. And uh, it meant when you look at, you know, the power play, the big guys were uh, scoring the goals. But, you know, the first goal was scored by Beecher, you know, fourth liner, first goal. Like, everybody contributed. So it's, it's spread around the team. And that's the other part is that I think the, the – core four or core five, uh, they need to do their job. They don't need to do the team's job. They need to do their job and let the others uh, do their job as well. The others have to do theirs in order to be successful. You know, it's funny, though, when you talk about the coaching stuff, I actually do picture you guys just in the room looking like the amount of film that you're watching during this series just over and over and over again, especially you as a coach looking for just like any edge. I'm curious how difficult it is, especially after a loss, if you're in Sheldon Keefe's shoes, how to balance that feeling of making a judge or a an a, a like making a change that doesn't feel like an overreaction? Like, what is an adjustment versus what is an overreaction, and how you balance that thinking? Well, I think at the end of the day, when you look back at the game, uh, first of all, if the Leafs start to go back home uh, tied one-one in the series, 
it's it's a great start to the series, no doubt. You know, because now they got they have home ice advantage. I think those are the things that you have to bring up in order to keep it positive, uh, especially after the way the first game ended, and say, listen, we got a chance to bounce back. You can look at you know the goals that were scored against them, two or power play goals, a two on one. There's small details there that you can tweak to, to make it better and uh, avoid you know falling behind too quickly and i think that's something they can do and and ironically enough in the playoffs every game is different and you know you you have to be able to park the last game and focus on the next one so i think those are the kind of things that sheldon has to deal with his team is like creating continue to create the positive vibes in that room say listen we're coming out tonight and we're going to, this is going to be a different game. And, you know, build on the stuff, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the goal they scored. If we can do more of this, it'll help us score more goals. If we can avoid this, uh, it'll prevent them from having scoring chances. And part of it, like you, we all mentioned, was discipline, controlled emotion. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had two power play goals. You know, uh, if we can avoid that, we just saved another couple of goals there. So, you know, you can dissect it in a way that you create a positive feedback and uh, create some, I guess, some excitement and emotion going into tonight's game. Yeah, that's the part that scares me, though, Claude, is the the emotional stuff is because it's like Sheldon Keefe has said that to this group multiple times in a variety of different ways. In fact, we got a pretty good look at it even as people on the outside because during the pandemic season, uh, they had the 24-7 Amazon series basically tracking them around. And even though poor Sheldon had to wear the mask the entire time and every time he gave a speech, it's like popping off his nose. <laughs> he's trying to put it back up. Like he's, he's given these guys this speech over and over and over again. And I feel like, yes, the accountability and that energy needs to be found somehow from those star players and that they are going to be the ones that have to set this tone and have to start feeling better about themselves. But yeah, was, was there something, anything in particular, like, you know, you're watching this game and you're going to be looking for tonight from Toronto where you say, Outside of the energy that the stars bring or the yet yeah, being disciplined, was there anything else that you saw where you went, oh, I would, I would be telling the coaching staff, maybe we tweak this? Yeah, well, I, I think the biggest thing for me is like, I just found that, you know, the, the amount of physicality, and I'm not mm-hmm. saying, listen, you need to finish your checks and all that stuff. I, I felt that they went above and beyond what they were as a team. Mm. So to me, the focus seemed to be more on that than what they do so well. And if I, if I was to say something to the team, I'd say, listen, this is our strength. This is what we do well. Can we do this to the best of our abilities tonight? Not just three or four guys, but the whole team. That's what I would do. And uh, I think if, if they can bring that to the game, they're going to get a much better chance of winning. than Like I, I really found, honestly, I said, I, I was look, watching and saying, what are they trying to prove by going out there and making all these big hits going out of their way when it's not really their style. And it's not that it's a bad thing, but it's not the way they play. So I'm saying if they're thinking about doing that, is their focus, is their focus that is usually on something else there to the, you know, to the max where it should be in the playoffs. And uh, so I found that a little bit, uh, you know, different from them. And I, I, to be honest with you, I said, I don't know if that's the best approach for the Maple Leafs to take. In other words, they're respected for the way they can score goals and create some offense. Bring that to the table. I know that the Bruins are going to try and, you know, prevent you from going there, but with commitment, dedication, and you say, listen, nobody's going to stop me from getting to the net or, or bringing pucks to the net or scoring goals. Uh, that's the, the, the will that you need in order to be successful in the playoffs. You know, I'm so glad that you're saying this, like a guy who actually knows things instead of just me, because did you, did you watch these two teams play in the regular season? Did you catch their games? Well, I did. And actually I was okay. here for one of the games because they celebrated our 2011 cup, right? Uh, that one game. Yes. And uh, I ended up, uh, I don't know if you heard, but I ended up, uh, Jim Montgomery had asked me to come in and uh, call the starting lineup and give them a speech and all that stuff. And, and, and what I said to them uh, before the game, and it, it could uh, be something that the, the Leafs would want to do, is that when we won the Cup, the players in that room, it didn't matter whether they were first-year you know, rookies or, or five-year, ten-year veterans, uh, they, they, none of them were allowed to have a free pass. And that was within, not from the coaching staff, but from the players themselves inside that room. Mm. Didn't matter if, if you're a rookie, 
you're in your first year. We don't care. If you're here, you need to be able to bring something. And everybody kind of made themselves accountable in that room and pushed each other. And I thought that was a great trend. But then again, you, you have to remember that, you know, I had the Cheras, I had the Bergerons, I had the Reckies, I had the Chris Kellys. I had a lot of great leadership in that room, and they were able to, to do that. So, you know, hopefully uh, Toronto can get that group of guys to be able to kind of create something very similar to that and uh, and bring it to the table. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, the, and I, I think that's really well said. Uh, the reason I brought it up, too, is I felt like Toronto has always had this with Boston, where they do try to match the physicality and the intensity, and it's like they want to go at Marchand, and that's what Domi's doing, right? Like, we're not afraid of you. Yeah. We're not afraid of you. We're not afraid of you. It's like, just win the hockey game, okay? Like, people don't want to see you wilt, That's what we want to see here. It's not that you need to go out and try to match Boston's physicality or be the tougher team or beat them up or prove that you have the snot. And I I just, I agree with you that at times I feel like, okay, it's great that you're sticking up for one another against Boston, or I guess it's great that you're not backing down from a Marsh and, and letting him just, you know, get into the head of, or the psyche of a Mitch Marner and chase him around and scare him. But yeah, ultimately play your game is what you're saying. And I really do like that. And when it comes to the accountability stuff, yeah, I'd really like to know what, where Toronto's at with that. Like what their leadership core is saying right now and the way that they communicate that to the rest of the room because I don't know if that's proven to any of us outside of it yet. Well, you know, at the end of the day, when you do that too, the accountability stuff, then you have to go out there and, and make yourself accountable as well, right? Yeah. So uh, as, a, as a core group, I think if they really, and especially if they're a solid core group, they've got each other's back. So it doesn't matter what is being said in that room, they're all going to support each other. So I think if they can create that, because, you know, so many times everything is, is put on the coach and the coach. And as you mentioned, when you were watching that, uh, that uh, show with the, with, uh, uh, Sheldon and, and he's talking, yeah. he's saying the right things, you know, you're seeing it, but at the end of the day, when you walk out of that room as a coach, you got to hope that the players take it over. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that are going to go out there and do it. But, you know, accountability amongst each other. uh, I thought that was great the year that we won. uh, How much, like I could hear even during the regular season, coming back in in my office after a period, and then you'd hear the guys coming in and and yelling, that's not good enough, and so on and so forth. And you could hear them yelling at each other. And then for me, it was easy. It was a matter of going back in that room and instead of, giving them the riot act for not being good enough. I knew they'd already dealt with it. I just made the adjustments that we needed to make going into the next period. So really makes a coach's job, when I say easier, uh, much better as well. But it certainly helps the team itself take accountability uh, with themselves. Mm, the, the, the fact that you're saying this stuff, one is, <laughs> again, I'm, I'm not going to say conclusively not, but I have my doubts as to the level of accountability in the Leafs room. But yeah, secondarily, it does make me think even a little differently of, yeah, the amount of coaching through the media that Sheldon Keefe will do at times and some of the quotes he'll have where he does try to really take them to task or hold them accountable and whether or not that has to do at all with what he ends up actually seeing from his team in the room. Well, again, like I'm not trying to stir the pot here by any means, JD, because I don't know what's going on in that room. Mm -hmm. Uh, What I'm doing is I'm sharing what, was happening in ours, which I thought really helped us be successful. And I think at the end of the day, if if the Leafs can create that in their room, and and you'll be able to tell just by the way to go out there and and play how they're accountable to each other. And Mm -hmm. like you said, it's not about, you know, Brad Marchand, and and I can say it openly, Brad Marchand has never scared anybody because he's not a guy that drops the gloves is super tough. He's just a pest, right? And he's Mm -hmm. a good pest. He does it the right way. So, uh, the key to that is not to fall into that trap and stay focused on what you have to do. No issues at all when there's scrums and everybody gets in there and you're showing that you're supporting each other. But don't get caught in taking those uh, retaliatory penalties just because you want to get back to an individual. And I think, you know, every time I've been with uh, Hockey Canada and did the Team Canada stuff, we always talk about that, you know, controlled emotions. You don't want to take stupid penalties. I think it, it uh, that is something that the Leafs have to kind of look at it as well when it comes to their discipline. Yeah. I think that they've always struggled with that control emotion. Like frankly, since like it's been one of the through lines of, I would say this team since they've established this new core and okay. Like you mentioned stirring the pot, 
I'm not trying to get you in trouble, but let's well, let me stir the pot a little bit here on this one. So you coached a lot of games against Barnard and Matthews. Did you feel like there was a game plan of, hey, let's get physical with them because they're not going to respond, but then also it might take some of their teammates out of it as well because then they start to play that undisciplined style and they lose focus on what their actual game plan is. Well, t- to be honest with you, I, I never kind of had my game plan based on trying to, uh, I guess, throw those guys off their games more than when we talked about, we said, listen, it's important that we finish our checks mm. on these guys, you know, and, uh, you know, as the series goes on, it's going to wear them out, et cetera. But it wasn't about chasing them. You know, when it came to certain players like Matthews, et cetera, you say, listen, you, you have to know where he's on the ice all the time and he's got the quick release, great shot. Let's make sure, you know, we're, we're aware of that. But it was never like, never really went after one guy saying, let's attack this guy because, you know, at the end of the day, as I mentioned, and I got to be consistent with what I'm saying is it was about how we needed to play in order to be successful. So our focus was more on the things we needed to do versus, you know, having to attack one player. And uh, what we talked about was more of a team thing, like, hey, let's finish our checks. Let's make sure we keep those guys on the outside. Uh, Let's not give them great scoring chances. But that's all part of our game plan and not so much about, you know, uh, uh, attacking an individual. When I say attacking or watching an individual, it's just bringing awareness. If you were coaching the Bruins tonight, who would you put in that? I'd go back with the same goaltender. Mm Mm-hmm. No, no, no doubt. And you know, and I understand what uh, what Jim said when he, he mentioned, "Hey, listen, we've had a two goalie uh, rotation here, and we might do that." And then, you know, it doesn't mean you have to go one game, one game, one game. But it could be mm-hmm. like, hey, maybe when they go to Toronto, uh, depending on what happens tonight too, maybe when they go to Toronto, they, they use a uh, Allmark, you know. And uh, but at the end of the day, when you look at the stats that Swayman has against the Leafs, you know you you have to think about that too. He's had the really good success against them. So do you, you ride him as well. And maybe the other guy doesn't come in till the next round, but I think, you know, a lot of people were asking questions about last year because he put in Swayman only in game seven and uh, mm-hmm. people felt it was too late. So, you know, a lot of that is having to deal with, you know, the people talking about the past and what he wants to do moving forward and what he's learned from it as well. Yeah. I I feel like those two guys have an incredible relationship. The two goaltenders, Uh, they're unbelievably supportive of one another, close with one another. They've had this plan all year of rotating Um, like all Mark, again, a guy who won the Vesna the season before he played consecutive games only once all season, which is shocking to see, right? Like it's, it's, it's incredible that they've been able to do this. But I would just look at it from, like, you know, I know you're the, you're the guy who's doing, hey, control what we control, control what we control, focus on us. I was saying if I'm the Toronto Maple Leafs and I'd be looking at what they're thinking, uh, from that mental standpoint, Swayman shut you down in three straight games. Like he has stymied them. I'm going, I'm not giving them a different look. I'm showing them that same guy because I got to think that there's some part of the Leafs that when Swayman is making a big save early on in a hockey game, that it does have a bit of a ripple effect on Toronto. And it also might be just the, the best thing for the Bruins as well. Well, you know, if I was the, uh, if I was the coach right now or whatever, I would have, I would definitely go back. And mm-hmm. I mean, we have access to all these video clips, right? And you can go back to those other games and you could probably pull out the number of, you know, grade A scoring chances that you had. And maybe you you come up with something where you're saying, listen, guys, is it so much Swayman or is it us that aren't creating enough grade A chances? Mm. Why are we not scoring? You know, you you find solutions to the problems. And that's what you have to do as coaches is say, okay, why is that happening? And at the same time, if, if you're able to create that or if you're able to show that, then players say, oh, well, we can score on this guy. We just got to get, you know, in better scoring areas. Like, you know, again, I go back to the goal that was scored last game. Mm-hmm. Uh, to me, that was, you know, the perfect uh, example of what Toronto needs to do to score goals against the Boston Bruins is, again, putting pucks at the net, uh, being in motion, getting on the inside and jumping on those loose pucks with some guys in front of the goaltender as well. You need some screens and you need secondary mm-hmm. players to come in and jump on those loose pucks. So, Uh, I think that's going to be a key to scoring against uh, the Boston Bruins and Swayman. Yeah, uh, completely agree. Uh, Last one for me, Chloe. You've been really generous with the time today. So Leafs have Nylander, who is able to skate, but he's very stiff. We don't know exactly what the injury is, but um, it's something where he's clearly not at 100% because we have video footage of him skating, and he he doesn't have that same pop to his game, that same fluidity to his game. 
when you're a coach and you have situations like this in the playoffs where it's like the guy in a regular season is obviously sitting, um, but your medical staff is telling you maybe he can play ish. Like what is the determination ultimately for a coach where you say to a guy, Hey, I- I'm going to take this out of your hands because players play through such incredible injuries in the Stanley cup playoffs, right? It's just, it's every single season we get it where, Oh, team gets eliminated. And then you get to see who's going in for surgeries or who's about to have what, or who was dealing with what injuries, but you as a head coach, like what is your role in making this assessment about a player, especially of that caliber and whether or not they're able to, or, you know, play in a game like this. Well, this is, this is what I've always done uh, in the past. And I've always said that when a player was injured, uh, I relied on the medical staff. And that, the mm-hmm. medical staff is not just the medical trainers. It's also the doctors. And I said, if the doctors and the medical staff tells me he can't go, and most of the time it's because, you know, the injury could get worse and mm-hmm. he could be out for a long time or he's definitely not ready. I said, you'll never hear a peep from me. But I said, if you're telling me that the guy is, is injured, he can go if he can tolerate the pain and there's no damage There's no damage that will get any worse, then I said, then he belongs to me. So mm. then I would meet with the player and say, listen, you know, the doctors say, you know, you are injured and you're hurting. Uh, are you able to play through the pain or not? You know, and uh, this is where I would uh, take charge of the situation. So, uh, I mean, you know, who knows what's going on with uh, Nylander, as you know, in the playoffs, uh, not much is being said, but uh, if he's being told, uh, if Sheldon's being told by the medical staff that, uh, no, you can't, because uh, if he gets injured again, he's out for the year or he's out for a month. Uh, in the meantime, if we wait a little longer, he could be ready for a game, whatever, three, four, whatever that may be. Uh, then you have to, you know, you have to weigh that in and uh, understand that there's a big risk and probably better off to hold off. So, uh, not knowing what uh, is going on, we can't uh, say anything here with them, but that's how I handle the injuries with our team and the doctors and medical staff respected that part of it as well. Hey, Claude, again, this was incredibly insightful. I, I really appreciate you making the time today. Thanks so much and enjoy the game tonight. Well, thanks, JD. Appreciate uh, chatting with you. Yeah, take care. Uh, Claude Julien, uh, Stanley Cup champion and Jack Adams award-winning head coach.